God good? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Make yourself comfortable. How many would agree with me that long distance relationships can be difficult? You ever know anybody that was involved in a long distance relationship or maybe yourself? Uh, they're, they're difficult to maintain uh, at times. Uh, today's message is titled, Following Jesus at a Distance. And I can remember uh, after my parents divorcing, um, and my dad was, he ended up at one point, he was living in San Juan Capistrano. And so I would go visit him, me and my brothers, and we'd go over there and live there for the summer. Uh, and so while I was there, there was this cute girl down the street that I liked. We were like 12 or 13 years old at the time. And she liked me. Why are you so surprised at that? <laughs> she did. And so, you know, it, it was one of those uh, summer romances, you know. We just had, you know, fun. My brother actually liked her little sister, and, and so we didn't want to go home. And we're like, Mom, really? You miss us? Can we stay another week? A couple more weeks. But anyways, we eventually had to go home. And so then it was one of those things where we were like, okay, uh, we got to do the letters back and forth thing. And we, we would call once in a while, but mom would say, no, 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 that's way too expensive. Uh, and so was, we, we just had to uh, stick with sending letters back and forth. And so we'd get this letter. You know what it is? You get the letters. Like, wow. <laughs> it's so awesome. And it's like she's right there. You're reading it. It's so cool. And so you're sending one back. And you're waiting. And it takes, it seems like, forever to get another letter back. And so as we were doing this, and pretty soon, you know, I'd send a letter, and it was taking forever to get me one back. And, and, and the, the timeline seemed to get longer and longer. And now my brother, he was getting letters from his girlfriend or her sister, uh, like, every week. And I'm thinking, what's the deal? Um, must be getting lost in the mail, because I know she loves me. <laughs> so, and this, I mean, she was cute. Now, not like Sarah. I mean, Sarah's like smoking hot. <laughs> but, Rhea down the street in San Juan Capistrano, she was cute. And so, but, but over time, the letters stopped. And I'm like, what? And, and so, I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, she doesn't uh, like me no more or whatnot. And you're, you're just wondering what's going on. You can't, it's not like Facebook. You know, well, fine, I'm just going to defriend you. <laughs> I'm so mad at you right now. And so, eventually, it just died. Like so often, long-distance relationships do. They just, it's so hard because you can't be together. And, you know, because the problem is this, if you can finish this with me, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, you're just not thinking about him anymore. You don't see him anymore. And so, uh, pretty soon you're off doing other things, and other things fill that void. And so, pretty soon you're like, eh, whatever. That reminds me of a story that I've shared once before about uh, an Iraqi soldier. Well, he, he was a new enlisting, and after going through boot camp and training and stuff, he was, he was getting ready to be sent off to Iraq. And so, before he left, he made sure he, he, he got engaged with his girlfriend. And so, they're... Uh, about to leave, he's about to get on the bus, and so she meets him at the bus station, she says, whoa, 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 before you go, I have something for you. And so she went down to the uh, studio and took these glamour shots of herself, you know, and she gave them to him, said, hey, take these with you, never forget me. I love you, I'll be praying for you, I'll see you when you get back. And so he goes off, three months pass by, and they're sending back and forth letters, and, and everything's great, six months goes by, and the letters are still going, and nine months goes by, and the letters started slowing down. It's kind of like what I experienced. And so, all of a sudden, then he gets this one letter, he opens it up, and it's from his fiance. Basically saying, we're done. And he goes, I, she goes, I just can't live like this. You know, in, in nine months, I haven't seen you. I don't even know if you're okay. I'm tired of worrying. I just can't live like this. And besides, there's somebody else. <laughs> and I'm engaged. <laughs> And could you send the picture back? Because I want to use it for my engagement picture. So the guy's devastated. 
you know, he's able to fight for a country, and she's a very, you know, thing that keeps hope alive, and now all of a sudden that's gone, and so he's just like down, and all his, his comrades and his buddies are like, hey, what's, what's the matter, you all right? And he says, well, I got a letter from uh, my girlfriend, my fiance, and she uh, broke it off, and she's engaged to somebody else, and they're like, oh, dude, sorry. And so the guys kind of get together, they're trying, they want to cheer him up, and so they're like getting their pictures of their wives and their girlfriends, and they're all putting it in a box. And, and give it to him, and so he takes it, takes that glamour picture of his, throws it in the box with a note, sends it off to the lady. So she gets it, she's like, what is this? Opens it up, there's just a pile of pictures in there, and the little note, so she reads a note from him, and it says, oh, if you, know, if you would dig through the pictures, find yours, <laughs> and take it out, because for the life of me, I can't remember which one is you. <laughs> that. <laughs> but the point is, in both of those scenarios, long-distance relationships are difficult. They're, they are hard. Now, there's exceptions to the rule. Some of you know somebody. Maybe you are a survivor of a long-distance relationship, and, and you've made it work, and you kept it together. Congratulations, but for the most part, it doesn't work, or it's very difficult uh, to work, especially when it's a newly developing relationship. And so today, I want us to talk about uh, that because in our relationship with Christ, if we allow distance in our relationship, if we walk through life living out this long-distance relationship with Christ, the same results happen. That out of sight, out of mind, kind of the, the communication breaks down. I'm not reading the Bible like I used to or spending time in prayer like I used to. I'm not even going to church as much as I used to. I'm kind of following Jesus. I still believe in Jesus, but it's at a distance kind of following him at a distance. I still consider myself a follower of Christ. The problem is it's just at a distance. That's what we want to talk about this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, this morning, I thank you for these believers that are here in your house that have come to worship you. Lord, I ask that you would minister to them through your word, that your spirit rests on every word spoken in this place, and so that your people would grow and become more like you, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. all right, okay, let me give you guys a little insight, spiritual insight here. You need to understand, Satan wants you, he wants to do everything he can to create distance between you and God. He wants to create an expanse, that this gulf, if you will, between you and God. To pull you away from God. And there's two reasons why he wants to do that that are obvious. Number one, it keeps you far from God. If he can put stuff in your life to put distance between you and God and keep filling that expanse with more and more stuff, that's what he's going to do. Because why? It pulls God more and more and more out of your life. And that's the goal. He wants to create distance. Because just as we have learned... It's difficult to develop a relationship when there's distance in that relationship. Same is true with God. The same thing that took place in my life and that Iraqi soldier's life in the physical realm, the same thing is true in the spiritual realm if we're not careful. Now, here's the other reason why Satan tries to create this expanse. It keeps you close to Satan. Whoa. <laughs> Time out. Okay, pastors, one thing for you to say that maybe I'm dripping them under some distance between me and God, but don't say I'm close to Satan. That's not my desire whatsoever. Now, there's something you need to understand. That in the spirit realm, there's no, like, gray zone necessarily. There's no, uh, you know, God's over here, Satan's over here, and I'm over here. It's one way or the other. Now, I want to show you this, this, this little this little. Example. Now watch this. Look at this. That X is you. Now there's some truth to this because the closer you get to God, it's not just that you're on fire for God, like yeah, I'm really close to God, or me and God are tight. Man, I'm just so excited about the things of God. Man, me and the Lord are, are closer than ever before. No, but the other truth is the closer you get to God, the further you are from Satan. The closer you get to righteousness, the further you are away from unrighteousness. The closer you are to God, the further you are away from Satan. 
The closer you are to light, the further you are from darkness. It's just one way or another. So, you need to understand this. If you are walking in a distance, if you are following Christ in a distance, in other words, if you're really not on fire for God anymore, and you don't hardly go to church anymore, you don't spend time with the Bible anymore, you don't pray anymore, you just kind of exist, you're following God, you would describe yourself as a Christ follower, but it's at a distance. Well, the opposite is true then, too. If there's distance between you and God, then you're closer to Satan. Because just like when you're really tight with God, I mean, you're just on fire for God. You're excited about the things of God. And it makes it easy for you to pray. You like going to church. You like to serve. You're just in love with the things of God. You're excited about the things of God because you're close to God. But what happens when you allow this expanse to develop and you drift from God and you walk those same things and desires and passions begin to dissipate? But now... You have a greater focus on the things of the world. It's easy for you to follow some of these trends of the world in our culture that do certain things that normally you would never even think of when you're really close with Christ. But now that you've drifted, those things are kind of out of sight, out of mind, and over here is the, where you're at. And it's like the, the frog in the kettle. It doesn't happen overnight. Satan knows that you can't just turn the light off and have you in darkness because you'll be in shock. You're like, whoa, this isn't right. I shouldn't be here. Remember those times when you <laughs> commit sin and the guilt was just like, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was like slapping you upside the head? I mean, you couldn't shake it. But when you create this distance, it gets easier and you become comfortable and you adjust. And it's not so bad. I mean, so what? Everybody's doing it. Is it really that big of a deal? And this is the problem. We have to understand this truth that the closer you get to God, the further you are away from the Satan and the things of ungodliness and unrighteousness and darkness. But the opposite is true. And that is what we really want to describe or to look at today and realize that Satan knows that if he can put that expanse between you and God, he also knows he, he dials down your zeal, your passion, your enthusiasm for the things of God. And it dials up your enthusiasm for the things of the world. Because you're like, no, 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 no. Because listen, you've got to understand, there's a battle going on every day in your life. You have a sin nature that wants to sin. I mean, really, you have a sin nature that wants to sin. Look to your neighbor next to you and say, hey, you have a sin, not you. You have a sin nature that wants to sin. <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> That's the way we're wired. But when you're tight with God, you guys like saying it, huh? You're, some of you are telling everybody, you God, you have victory over the sinful nature because the, the, the power of the Spirit and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the things of God are more dominant in your life. But when you drift over here and you get way over here, all of a sudden that sin nature is like, yeah, now it's my time. And that becomes the more the influential force in your life. And so, look, the Bible says in Galatians that, look, if you sow it by the flesh, by the flesh you shall reap destruction. But if you sow it by the Spirit, by that Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. It's wherever you're reaping that determines your direction. And so you need to understand that. So today, I want to show you something. By looking at what I call the Pharaoh factor. Remember King Pharaoh, the, you know, the leader of Egypt? And he had all the Israelites in bondage for 400 years and finally... God sends Moses in there, and Moses is saying, hey, let my people go. Pharaoh's like, no, I won't. And so Moses is like, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, I won't. And so then there's a series of plagues that take place, and all this dialogue, and back and forth, back and forth. And finally, Pharaoh's fed up. Because, now listen, I want you to think about this. Because Pharaoh, like Satan, wants to keep you in bondage. Pharaoh wanted to keep the Israelites in bondage. Pharaoh wanted to control the Israelites. And he didn't care anything about them except what he could get out of them. Satan is the same way. He, he wants to keep you in bondage. He wants to be in control of your life. He doesn't care about anything in your life or you as a person. So Pharaoh is like Satan. There's a parallel there. 
So here's the deal. Here's how it works with us. In the physical realm here, I'm going to show you something that takes place in the spiritual realm. Pharaoh is finally at the point where he's like, fine, because Moses is saying, look, we just want to go out in the wilderness and worship our God. That's all. Let us go out into the wilderness so we can worship our God. Finally, Pharaoh says, fine, go. And that brings us to where we're at here in Exodus 8, 28. And it says this. That this is Pharaoh. All right, go ahead, Pharaoh replied. I will let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to your God. Now, now think about this. When you're getting close to God, or maybe you're making a decision to accept Christ and turn your life around, Satan is just like freaking out. He doesn't want to let you go like Pharaoh. Or if you want to start stepping up in the kingdom and doing more for the kingdom, Satan's like, no, 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 no. And you just like Pharaoh, this is what Satan does. Pharaoh says, fine, go. Look what else. But don't go very far. Now hurry and pray for me. That is exactly what Satan does. If he's going to lose the battle with you, finally he's going to say, okay, fine, go do your church thing. Don't go very far. Don't go out of my sight. Because when I need to, I'm going to reel you back in. And even today in your spiritual walk, that's what Satan says. To you. Okay, fine. I don't want you to go very far, though. Because he knows the closer he can keep you to him, the greater the influences he has in your life. And, and, and so what we want to do is create an expanse between us and the enemy. And like I said in the diagram, the closer you get to God, the further you are from Satan. The further you get away from God, the closer you are to Satan, to darkness, to ungodliness, to wickedness and worldliness. That's just the way it is. There's no getting around that. There's no like, well, I'm not serving Jesus like I used to, but no, I don't want anything to do with the devil. I'm just out there somewhere. It doesn't work that way. And so it is a battle between light and darkness. Righteousness and unrighteousness. And that war goes on every single day. And you need to know that there is spiritual warfare that takes place every day in your life. Every day. Because there's a spirit that lives in you that wants to pull you to God. There's a sinful nature of flesh that wants to drift towards Satan. There's a battle every single day. That's why Paul in the Bible said, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. What was me? Because of the battle. There's always a seesaw back and forth, the struggle. We are all in spiritual warfare. And every day you say, God, help me to live for you. Don't take it for granted. Realize that your adversary is looking to trip you up at any given moment. So I'm going to give you a biblical example. Real quick. If you grab your outlines and follow along as well, continue. I'm going to give you the benefits of staying close to Jesus. The first one is this, if you, when you stay close to Jesus, you will live for Him. Your life will revolve around Christ. You will live for Him. And everything you say and do and all that you're doing and all that you're involved in, Christ is going to be in that. You're going to live for Him in all these things. Now, understand this. Peter will be our example for today. You see, Peter was tight with Jesus. He lived with him for three, over three years and traveled with him, sat around the campfire, listened to all the uh, awesome teachings about the kingdom of God. They watched and experienced Jesus doing incredible miracles. Uh, uh, and so they served under Jesus and were continuing to learn and to grow and to feed off of Jesus. It was just incredible. I mean, they were a team. Well, then it gets to the point where Jesus is sitting, is sitting down with his disciples and saying, Hey, guys, listen. I want you to know something. My time here is real short. I'm going to be, my life's going to be taken from me. And he began to explain that he's going to lay down his life, basically, for the sins of the world. They're, they weren't quite getting it. Peter didn't want anything to do with that. And Peter says in Mark 14, 29 through 31, this. Peter said to him, because remember now, Jesus is saying, oh, no. And by the way, all of you are going to desert me. You're going to take off running. To that, Peter said, 
If everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others bowed the same. Now isn't it interesting, Peter, at this moment in his life, was willing to die, was willing to sacrifice all. He was willing to live for Jesus. Christ was his purpose for life. And he's like, no, I'm going with you. I'm dying with you. I'll never deny you. I'm with you. Everybody else might do it, but I'm in it to win it. You can trust me. You can count on me, Jesus. See, when you're walking close with Christ, you want to live for him. You'll sacrifice for him. You'll lay down your life for him. That's just the way it works. And so when we allow an expanse to develop, long distance relationship, if you will, that out of sight, out of mind, and then pretty soon, that passion and that willingness to give your all But one of the benefits of staying close to Christ is that you will live for him. People say, Pastor, how do I get over this bondage? How do I get over this sin in my life? And there's such a focus on the sin. And like, you know, is there like this I should do or this? And how do, how do I overcome this sin? How do I overcome this? This thing is just haunting me. This thing is just destroying me. This thing is just has, you know, my life in a mess. And I said, quit focusing. Don't worry about your sin. Quit focusing on it. Really? Focus on Christ. Draw nigh unto Him. Because He's the answer. He, it's the truth that sets you free. It's His Word. It's His life. It's His Spirit. Pursue God. And these other things begin to fall off. See, we want to try to shake these things off in our life so that we might pursue God. Because you're guilty. You feel guilty. You feel like, oh, I'm not fine. I'm a hypocrite. Hey, look, we're all a mess. We just need to realize that we are continuing every single day to become more and more like Him. And so you focus on him and the stuff, the junk, the habits, hang-ups, and hurts draw off. They dissipate. As Christ becomes greater in your life, the problems become smaller. But whatever it is you're focusing on is the greater in your life. If you're constantly, 24-7, focusing on your problem, 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 it's huge. But when you focus on God, he's my source, he's my strength. And he becomes greater and the problems become smaller. Christ is your victory. Get it? Amen. All right, the other benefit is this. You'll defend him. When you're walking close with Christ, you are willing to defend him. If someone says something, you can say, no, that's not true. See, we, sometimes we cower down or ashamed of the Gospels uh, or uh, people are putting Christianity down or something like that. We kind of cower down and back off or we just avoid them. It's almost we're ashamed. But when you're close with Christ, if you're walking in step with him, you will defend him. Remember in the garden, when the religious leaders were coming to arrest Jesus, and they had the mob coming, and they had their torches, and they're all there, uh, they're trying to find Jesus, to arrest Jesus, and they're looking for Jesus, and, and so we know the story. One of those that was with Jesus pulls out a sword and cuts the ear off of one of the uh, high priest's servants. Look what it says here. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Now, if you read some of the other Gospels, you realize that that person that pulled out the sword was Peter. Peter slashed the ear off. Peter, when he was close, look, he wants to defend him or live for him, Christ. And when you're close with God, you'll defend him because that's your Savior, that's your Lord. And when we look at Peter's life, we see him standing and saying, I will, you, I will have your back to the very end. I will die. I will never deny you. You see Peter in the garden pulling out a sword and cutting the servant's ear off. He will defend Jesus. That's where we are all working to be and working toward in order to be that for him. Now, the downside is when we allow Satan to come in, create distance between us and our Savior. It creates all kinds of problems. 
And one of them is when when it's, when you begin to live that life of distance between you and your Savior, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and you're kind of like you know doing your own thing. You think of God from time to time when there's a need, there's a crisis, or you casually come to church once in a while, or you know every once in a while you might read the Bible. You're just you're just casually following Jesus, and so in other words, you're following that a distance. What happens is, A, you grow cold towards God. You used to be hot. You used to be on fire for God. But now you're beginning to grow cold towards the things of God. They don't turn you on as much as they used to. They don't fire you up the way they used to. You've kind of been there, done that. And you just continue to drift. And see... Mark 14, verse 54 says, Meanwhile, <clears throat> Peter followed him at a distance. Remember Peter. Everyone else is going to flee but me. I'll have your back. And they did. They all took off. Even Peter. But uh, whether it was curiosity or guilt, we don't know. But he wanted to see what was going to happen to Jesus. So he went after him. But he didn't pursue them. He, it was at a distance. He kept his distance. He was watching the crowd as they had taken Jesus away off into the distance, and he kind of pursued and staying in the shadows and, and trying not to be noticed, and he ends up going into the courtyard. Listen to this. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There, he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. So here was Peter in the courtyard, warming himself by the fire. You see, when you follow Jesus at a distance, you become cold towards the things of God. And if that continues, you'll find yourself at some point in your life warming yourself by the fires of this world. And finding warmth, finding solutions, finding your answers, trying anyways, with the things of the world. And that's where Peter ended up, by this fire, warming himself. And you get involved in other things. And Satan will do whatever he can to create that expanse. And to do whatever he can to make you follow God at a distance. Uncommitted. Casual. If I make it to church, I will. If I, I don't know, if I thought I'd read the Bible, I will. If I'm, I don't know, I'll pray, well, and sometimes we know God will make us pray because he'll bring a crisis in our life just to get us to look up. God's always working. Again, it's, there's spiritual warfare taking place. And, and Satan's always wanting to create that expanse between you and God so that fire dissipates that you once had for God. And then you find yourself warming yourself up to the fires of this world. And what happens when that happens? Because you need to understand, maybe it's sin that Satan brought into your life that has just gotten you off the deep end. You still believe in God. You're still a follower of Christ, but it's at a distance now. Because you're battling something. Satan will do that. Maybe he'll distract you with, with the pleasures of this world, with prosperity, with, with power, with possessions. All these things become a distraction that we're warming ourselves up. They're taking God's place. They're like, these things turn me on now. These things excite me now. I, these things keep me up at night. These things I can't wait to get up in the morning and pursue again. These things are my life. And so you're warming yourself up to these things. You're allowing these things, these prosperity, power, possessions, or maybe it's sin to take the place of God. It just happens. It's the, like I said, the frog in the kettle, where it's a slow drip. It's just a slow fade find yourself there. Then, then guess what happens? Like we see in Peter's life. You get to a place where you disown God. Look what it says here in Mark 14, 71 and 72. Peter swore a curse. Now let me just stop right there. Let me, hold on right there. Remember when Jesus said, Peter, I know you're all zealous and excited and committed to me. I get that, but you know what? You're going to deny me three times tonight. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. At this verse here, I mean, he 
He had the young lady go to him. This is Peter. I will die for you. Everyone else will scatter but me. I'm in it to win. And Peter, who pulled the sword out and cut the servant's ear off, that Peter is now warming himself up at this fire. And a young lady comes up and says, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? No way. I don't know what you're talking about. And then again was approached. Aren't, weren't you with Jesus? No, I had nothing to do. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. And then he had the rooster crow. And then approached again. In Mark 14 it says this, Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. Wow. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. How does this happen? How in the world does Peter go from, I will die for you. I will never deny you. The Peter who pulled the sword out, cut the servant's ear off. I will defend you. How does he go from that to this? To where in front of a young little girl he denies even knowing God. And in the third denial, to even be able to say this, a curse be on me if I'm lying. He wanted so badly to convince those around him that he had nothing to do with Jesus, didn't even know him, to where he would say, a curse on me if I'm lying. I do not know the man. But that's what happens when you follow Jesus at a distance. Because that's, when he was with Jesus, I'm not going to die, I'll die for you, I'm not leaving you. When he was side by side with Jesus in the, in the garden, he's pulling out a sword. When he's tight with Jesus, when he's close, when he's with him, he's lived, wanting to live for him and defend him. But when all of a sudden he runs and he's following at a distance, it changes everything. And so my point is, what we see take place in Peter's life in the physical realm is the very same thing that Satan wants to do in our lives in the spiritual realm. To where when we fall at a distance, that fire for God goes out to where we're warming ourselves up with the fires of this world, which can never satisfy us, to the point where we're like, who what God? To the point where we deny him, even knowing him. You know, sometimes our denial isn't quite as obvious as Peter's. It was just flat out, I don't know the man. I don't know if any of us would actually say that. But sometimes our lifestyles can deny him. Sometimes our lifestyle, we step on the campus and we pretend we don't even know God. I'm not a Christian, don't you worry. On the workplace, and some of the things that we do and say, that we even belong to him. Oh, we're not broadcasting it. We don't have a bullhorn out there. But our lives, I wonder if the world around us would even know that we're Christian. And in these last days, I just think that maybe we need to check ourselves and say, you know what, I need to draw in. I need to make sure there's, Satan hasn't put an expanse between me and God. I need to make sure there's no distance because I, I, long distance relationships just don't work. And, and it's not going to work with God either. Just this casual contact once in a while. Seeing or coming to church once in a while. This whole uh, once in a while stuff isn't going to work in the faith. Because he's the Lord of my life. Every area of my life. He's the one whom I live for and get up for every single day. That's where God wants us. Every day. Get it? You know? There's so many different ways that we deny God. In our families of our friends. But as I was praying and thinking about this, God just spoke to me and said, and just revealed something, one of the biggest areas that the church or believers deny him in is in the battle of To where we disregard him. The laws of God. The, the biblical principles that transform our lives. And this isn't a political thing. I, 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 this isn't a Democrat thing, Republican thing, independent thing, libertarian thing. I am saying that we as a people, 
We are a nation. We are one nation under God. We are to put our trust in God. That's who we are, and that's what we need to get back to. And we need to vote that way as well, that we need to exalt the things of God so that this world might know him. Get it? That's what we have to do. And I, I think that there's so many things that Satan can just push us and push us away from the things of God to the point, like Peter, God. God's doing a whole new work, I believe. God is wanting part of the valley to rise up and be that light in this community, a beacon of hope to a lost and dying world. And you, me, we can't do that at a distance. We've got to draw nigh to God and hold on to God. Watch what God does. It doesn't matter. It could be you want to revitalize your faith, or maybe you need healing. You know, I think about the woman in, who was subject to bleeding. And she went to every doctor and literally spent every dime. And she was worse for it. She heard Jesus was. I gotta get to Jesus. And the Bible says that she pressed through the crowd. She was pushing her way through, reaching through, grab hold of Jesus. And she was healed. Jesus stopped and turned around. He wasn't concerned because someone touched him. Everybody's around and they're all bumping into him. But she took something from him. Her faith took the power of God from her. She believed. And when we pursue God like that, when we will push through the crowd, when we will push through the things of this world and grab hold of God, you will receive from God. You will experience God. You will experience God's faithfulness and love to bring peace in your life and joy and meet the needs in your life. And when you experience that, you never want to let go. And when you are experiencing that and never letting go, Satan, is furious because he therefore can no longer create an expanse. Let's grab God with everything within us and let's live for him. Get it? Amen. Let's pray.